Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tim's Vinyl Confessions. I'm Tim Durling, and I'm joined once again by my friend Jeff Witcher, Jeff Witcher's Final Destination. Hello, Jeff. Hello. How are you doing, Tim? Oh, really good. Really good. I was just telling Jeff before we started recording, we were just uh, just today as of this filming, we're uh, getting our first real amount of snowfall for the year. So uh, November 27th, I guess that's about, about time. Sometimes up here in Canada, like I'm in Eastern Canada, sometimes we get away sooner. So we'll, we'll take it. Um, buddy, it's actually been about a year ago that Jeff and I did a review episode for what at the time was the most recent Yes release. Uh, the Royal Affair live in Las Vegas album. And uh, so we're kind of continuing that tradition. But what's more exciting about that is that, that they've actually come out with a brand new studio album. Now, I, um, I've only been into Yes for about um, four years. So uh, I thought, well, yeah, I probably at this point, I probably won't be doing any review episodes of, of a new album. Um, but I'm wrong. And I'm glad to be wrong because uh, they just came out with the quest, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, gorgeous Roger Dean artwork. It just it looks like a classic. Uh, looks like a classic Yes album. I really like what they did with the logo. Uh, sort of a, it's it's sort of a stained glass look, but it's also there's a bird in there. I think yeah. And, yeah uh, thank you. That cover and uh, Jeff was generous enough to let me send this to him, and uh, so I, I got him a CD for to thank him. That was that was way back in July when that that this first became uh, available to pre-order. I remember my wife and I were on vacation and I was just on my phone. A new Yes album? Don't mind if I do. Uh, so yeah, it's um, because I think we talked about this because earlier this year we did a two-part episode where we went through all of our yes cds and um and i think I, I i don't think i'm off the mark by saying there aren't a lot of yes fans out there that were really thrilled with the heaven and earth album from 2014 uh which is you know the, the first one that they recorded with john davison on vocals and you know he's a fine singer and you know he fits the bill he fits the band really well but i just found that album to be boring really boring and, and unmemorable and for me to sit and and look at the song titles um i can't none of the songs come to me I, they're just they just not stick in my head so when they said that they were doing a new album i was thinking boy i i hope it's an improvement not that the bar was set very high uh so jeff what were your thoughts when you first discovered that uh there was a new yes album coming up well, I, you know, I have to admit, I wasn't really, my expectations weren't that great because of Heaven and Hell that had come before. It was one of these deals where, well, you know, do they really need another studio album, Heaven and Hell? It didn't seem like it was very inspired, and it just felt like it was kind of a color by numbers. It wasn't really anything, like you said, that's memorable. I couldn't tell you, you know, I couldn't even hum a melody from any of those tracks. So I was kind of like, well, I guess we'll we'll wait and see. You know, expectations weren't great. I was ready to kind of roll my eyes at it and think, well, if we got another Heaven and Hell, I'd just as soon not have another New Yes album. But, you know, you never know what you're going to get. I mean, who would have thought Deep Purple or ACDC's albums would have been as great as they were that came out yeah. the previous yeah. year. So. Really good, really good points. Uh, both of There's review episodes for both of those on uh, on my channel, too. Uh, this is the CD. So the, the record, the record comes with the CD, but like the Dream Theater one, you have to open it to get to it. So I said, well, I'll, I'll get some standalone CD. And I'm glad it did. This has three bonus tracks on it as well. Um, and, and I'm happy to report that, uh, in my opinion, and I think Jeff shares this opinion from our conversations, this is way better than Heaven and Earth. Like way, 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 way better. Uh, a, a fine, fine improvement. Um, so I made it a point to um, not listen to any of the preview songs. I really wanted to listen to them all in their entirety. But the first track uh, on the album, and also the first track that was made available, was The Ice Bridge. So, Jeff, in my opinion, this is the best song on the album. What, what are your thoughts on The Ice Bridge? 
Yeah, no, I, I'd have to agree with you. I mean, it definitely comes out swinging. And the first thing, which for me, I thought was a little um, interesting was the fact that it opens with a keyboard riff that sounds, it's, you know, one of these synthesizer trumpet things that sounds like the final countdown from Europe. That was kind of immediately when I heard that, I'm like, oh, wow, this sounds very retro uh, to me. That's not, what I, that's not what I thought you were going to say, but you're right. But when I first heard it, this it's a little more obscure. But we're talking, we're we're going back to the same year, nineteen eighty six. But you're right; those first two keyboards, like, whoop, 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 like that, that sort of that sort of horn trumpet sound, like you said, to me, it sounded exactly like "Touch and Go" by Emerson, Lake, and Powell. Which some people don't know that you know that was that one album that they did with Cozy Powell on drums, so that it was still ELP. But I remember seeing the video to that song. And if you go listen to the beginning of the ice bridge, touch and go, like, like the first two notes are the same. And Jeff Downs is like using the exact same uh, keyboard patch. And he does a lot of that on this album. I think there are some very, very 80s keyboard sounds on here. Not to the detriment of the, the songs, but I, I, I have to think it was on purpose. I, I have to think there was a certain amount of... Um, you know, intention gone into there. It's not like, you know, it's not like he's got this cheap Casio that only has so many presets, right? I mean, he can decide what, <laughs> what keyboard sounds to use. But the Ice Bridge is a great song. It's a great way to start the album. It's upbeat. Um, Alan White's drums sound fine on it. Uh, even though Jay Shellen is listed as, um, he's, he's pictured here in the credits. So you got sort of the three, you know, none, no original guys left. No original guys left, you know, what, what, with the death of Chris Squire in 2015. But you get like sort of the long campaigners. So you get Steve Howe, uh, Alan White, and Jeff Downsall on the top. And then sort of the quote unquote new kids on the block John Davison, um, Billy Sherwood, and Jay Shellen. Now, Jay Shellen, I think, is more of a touring drummer and, and helps out. Uh, I think he plays most of the songs live and they bring Alan up for a couple of songs. I'm not sure. But if it's true that, that Alan is playing all the songs on here, he sounds really good. And the ice bridge is broken up into three parts, which a lot of the songs on here are. So um, there was definitely, I, I don't know if you'd call this album a concept album all the way through, but um, they do have that breaking them up into separate parts, which is, that goes all the way back to um, Starship Trooper, I guess, you know, all the way, because I don't think there's any songs on the first album they did that with, and then they did it with Close to the Edge and and then, of course, Tales of Topographic Oceans, which is, is you know, altogether a different thing. One thing I noticed uh, interesting on here, and, and maybe it's my lack of uh, knowledge about, you know, prog rock in general, once you get past sort of the major players. Uh, this song was written by John Davison, Jeff Downs, and a guy named Francis Monkman. And that's not a name I recognize. Does that name ring a bell to you? I have no idea who that is. I'd have to Wikipedia, I think, that name. Yeah not ringing a bell for me at all i have no idea so then uh, the second track dare to know this is the steve Vi uh i almost said steve Vai. <laughs> this is the, this is a steve howe composition and um it's uh, it's mellower you know it is it's uh but it's not bad and it i i can you know the opening track i've got an idea i've been on my mind like th those are there's hooks written into these songs what did you think of dare to know I love Dare to Know, and I, this is my favorite track on the album. I will tell you, I confess, I know it's mellower, but I haven't heard this much melody in a Yes album in a very long time. And I, the thing that I like about Dare to Know is it's all, it's full of surprises. Like it starts out, you know, just kind of with a, an acoustic kind of a melody. And then there's this hook that starts right from the get-go. And then all of a sudden this orchestra or the string section comes in to kind of replay the motif. And it's like, wow, where did that come from? It adds a whole nother, it turns it into like the sweeping epic track, which I just love the fact that they just kind of throw that there in the middle. It sounds very much like the Moody Blues or ELO or something when that string section comes in. Almost Almost like a classic yes track, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But it was just like, wow, I was so impressed with this track.
because it took me off guard because I, and this is very much as you can tell it's a Steve Howe track because his guitar work is all over it. He's come up with a great melody here, a great hook. I think John Davison sings it well. I mean, this could have been really an outtake off of, and I know people are going to take me to task probably for saying this, but it really like a, a close to the edge or a tales from topographic ocean. Uh, you know, I know I'm being very hyperbole. Hy I've got a lot of hyperbole here, but you know, it really reminded me of some of my favorite stuff off of those two albums. Um, yeah. Well, the interesting thing is, I mean, where it is a solo Steve Howe composition, who knows how long it sat around? You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's really, really cool. I mean, I have no problem with there being a lot of mellow stuff on here as long as it's memorable and good. You know, I'm not I'm not putting on a, a, a 20, a 2021 20, album by Yes to bang my head. You know what I mean? Uh, they don't really have any. The only album that you can really bang your head any amount to by Yes, I think, is Drama. Um, but but when they do it, it's very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Third track, probably my second favorite on the album, Minus the Man. This is a John Davis and Billy Sherwood composition. I think it's so full of hooks. I love the turn for, you know, the, the, the building a Superman minus the man. It's about technology. And um, I really, really, really enjoy this one. Like, you know, uh, job well done on this one. They actually credit, uh, there's a conductor they credit on this one. Fames Studio Orchestra, Oleg Kontratenko is credited as conductor. I guess he's on a few of these. But uh, what are your thoughts on Minus the Man? Yeah, it's another slower track. I don't know if I'd call it a ballad, but it's definitely, it's taken at a slower tempo. You've got more strings on here again, just like the previous track. Beautiful guitar work by Steve Howe. I think this is really uh, another song where he shines uh, acoustically on there. Like you say, it's got a great melody. Uh, I love the lyrics. I, I just think it's another, like after the surprise of, the first two tracks, how great those were, you know, minus the man just again carries it forward and it's got great hook, great melody, great guitar work by Steve Howe. You've got some strings that aren't overdone. So you're thinking this is going to be some sort of orchestra album. I mean, it's not. It's done very tastefully. I think it's such an effective song. It, again, one of those tracks that reminds you of Yes from the, the 70s, some of their best work. So I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it, it's it really, really good. And when you get, you know, it's great when you have these new albums by these veteran bands and you're not listening to them, you get the songs in your head. That's a good sign. So already, already three strong songs in. And I was thinking to myself, I hope this isn't the case, but if the rest of the album absolutely sucked, it's still better than Have It and Earth. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't. Track four is Leave Well Alone. This is another Steve Howe uh, written song. He's seen here playing, I don't know if that's an Omnichord or a lap steel guitar. Uh, they usually do credit. Okay, so yeah, Steve Howe usually credits what he plays. So uh, let's see, Koto, maybe it's a Koto. Gibson, F4 mandolin, Fender Stratocaster, Stringmaster steel guitar. That's probably what that is. Now, there's another one that's brought up, uh, uh, broken up into three parts. I am starting to notice that I think we what we're hearing now is Steve Howe chiming in on some background vocals as well. And to a certain extent, I understand why that is. Unfortunately, Chris Squire is gone in his background, not only his bass playing, but his background vocals were such a fundamental part of the yes sound. So that whether you had John Anderson or uh, a, a song that Trevor Rabin sang or um, Benoit David or, you, you know, or Trevor Horn, when you've got Chris there on those background vocals, it's a little bit like Michael Anthony from Van Halen. It sounds like the band. Steve Howe is not a singer. He's a guitar player. He's yeah. a guitar player that occasionally sings. And, but I, it doesn't, to me, there's no detriment. It's not to the detriment of the song. And I think that they, they just wanted to um, have that one of those classic members singing the background vocals to fill the void with Chris Wire. But I don't know why they didn't just let Billy do it because uh, Billy's a perfectly good singer in his own right. But, but not a bad song. Uh, Leave Well Alone. What are your thoughts on, on that one? Yeah, that reminds me. I mean, I really, I would have, if I hadn't known this was off the new album, I might have dated this song around 88 or 89, just because of that opening. You Again, you've got kind of that synth, classic 80s synthesizer. You've got a good bass riff. Yeah. 
there. And then it kind of slows down. It reminds me of in Perpetual Change, that song where it's like bombastic and then it slows down. It gets kind of quiet and acoustic. And that's what this song does. It starts out almost like an 80 hard rock, 80s hard rock track. And then it kind of, they slow down the tempo. It's just kind of acoustic. You got Steve Howard doing some nice guitar work. Um, you got a great melodic guitar line. And the recurring motif at the end, they keep repeating the motif at the end of the song. It kind of reminds me at the end of Starship Trooper, how they just keep going over that same riff over and over and over again. It reminded me a lot of that as kind of like as the song's ending, you've got that repeated. But yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that it sounded late 80s with the synth tones, because yeah, it, it, I remember thinking again, it's a Steve Vai composition by himself. We don't know how old it is. It, it wouldn't have sounded completely out of place on the, um, I can never remember the order. Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, Howe, uh, that album they put out in 1989, which I consider a yes album. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it is kind of dated to its its time, but, but not in a bad way. Next song is The Western Edge. Uh, and this one is uh, John Davis and Billy Sherwood. And what I like about this, uh, this brings to another point that I like about the album, even though that these songs are brought in by various combinations of members, it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like a, a, co a cohesive yes album. Uh, the Western Edge, um, again, it, it's uh, it's memorable. Uh, you know, it's not one of my favorites on here, but I, I enjoy it. Um, did you have any any particular thoughts on that? Yeah, I like it like you. It's not my favorite, but I think it's, you know, it's an up-tempo track, which I, I, I think is great. You know, I, I thought it was fine enough. Um, you know, I think uh, to me, honestly, this is the last track on this album that sounds like a classic Yes track. After this track, it feels like it's almost a different band or a different John Davison sings differently. It sounds a lot softer, a, a little more gentle after this track. This is the last one that really kind of reminds me of, of classic Yes. So, yeah, I think it's fine. It's my least favorite of the first five tracks i guess um but you know it's decent it's better than it's still better than anything off heaven and hell yeah yeah um it's so the next track. it's funny you mentioned that because so the next track future memories uh this is the first one that john davison i believe wrote solo uh, it's only credited to him and i guess you'd call it a ballad and to me um it sounds like it doesn't necessarily sound like classic yes but it, it kind of follows to me in the footsteps of, of other ballads of theirs, like Wondrous Stories, um, Onward, maybe Madrigal. So it's just, a, or, or, or soon, like the soon part of Gates of Delirium. It's pretty mm -hmm. much a John Davis and, you know, there's no drums on this song. Um, yeah, it, it, the, 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 the energy level drops way, way down. But again, um, the from this moment, forward that's a hook you know i get that in my head and you know i mean back in the day who knows this may have been a single you you, you know so um but yeah um a decent enough song but you're right it's it's it, it's lost a lot of momentum um next one is another uh steve howe song which as i look ahead okay um one of the bonus tracks breaks this tradition but um for the most part steve howe's delivering these songs himself music to my ears um I think this one is, uh, I, 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 the same music to my ears, I, get, I, I can get it in my head how it goes. It's a laid back kind of song. It's got drums in it. Um, I'm trying to think what, uh, you know, a classic yes song that would have, it would put me in mind of. Um, and I, for some reason, I'm, I'm sort of fixated on the, the going for the one tornado period. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, nothing's coming to me right now, but, you know, maybe a song like, what is the one, the... Uh, parts of the uh arriving ufo song or uh, even um parts of awaken maybe maybe that's the wrong comparison but uh but not bad not bad and again we don't know how old the song is what are your thoughts on music to my ears yeah i like that better than future memories um you know it's kind of a mid-tempo a little bit of a lush rocker uh it's got some interesting moments on it i mean it's memorable like you say it's a song that will stick with you after you've heard it. Uh, it, it seems like towards the end of this album, they're, they're kind of just, well, for whatever reason, slowing down the tempo, doing things a little bit softer. 
Um, but yeah, you can tell it's a Steve Howe track. Um, yeah, I, I like it. It's decent. It's still, yeah, I feel like as the album goes on, it kind of fizzles out a little bit, I guess, just because it started off so strong. And then as it goes on, it's kind of like with each subsequent song, I'm kind of, you know, getting less enthusiastic about it, but I, it's fine. You know, it's still, like you say, better than what was on the previous album. But when you've laid the groundwork with such fantastic songs like the first five, I, I kind of was hoping for something a little bit more, I guess, as the album. Yeah. Out, you know. It, it would have been nice if they'd, if they'd have put something else in towards the end with a little bit more of that force that something like the Ice Bridge had, but they didn't. Um, final song on the album on the album proper uh, is A Living Island. This one's a John Davis and Jeff Downs uh, track, and it's another, um, another three-parter. This one um, doesn't stick with me quite as well. Uh, the lyrics are great, you know, I, I, you know, the lyric, as always, I mean, Yes, never really phones in the lyrics, um, but um, I don't know. I, I don't have much to say about this one. I just I don't think it's bad. But what do you have any anything on this particular track? Yeah, it doesn't really do anything for me. I mean, I get excited when I see a song broken up into three parts. I expect it to be kind of like a journey, and for it to be at least interesting, and you know, at the very least, kind of progressive rock. But it didn't really grab me that much. I kind of felt it was really I, I couldn't tell you where the three parts stop and where they, you know, begin. The next one begins. It's just sort of like, okay, well, whatever. You felt you had to break it into three parts, but it doesn't sound like a progressive rock track to me, and it doesn't really go to any interesting places. It's, I, which is disappointing because I really like you. I would have loved to have, you know, bookend that album. You got the great Ice Bridge. Bookend it with another great hard rock track that at least. Uh, you know, has some great guitar work, some great melody, and kind of leaves you excited for, you know, maybe the next Yes Studio album. Um, but, you know, yeah. they it's fine. I'm not going to complain because on the whole, I think it's a great studio album. I think it's way better than I would have expected. I think it's got enough classic Yes elements. There's some classic 80s rock elements in there that I think are done well. They don't sound cheesy. So I would say it's a success. I mean, I think maybe I would have sequenced the album a little bit better so it wasn't so top heavy, but uh, you know, whatever, that's fine. I'll, I'll still take it. Yeah. Yeah, that one, that last one, the, the, the um, uh, what is it? Yeah, Living, I almost said Lonely Island, the Living Island. And it almost sounds like they, they gave it the three names for the parts just for the sake of it. Because if you go back and you listen to Starship Trooper or Close to the Edge, there are very distinct parts you can say, oh, okay, this is they. There's a definite mood shift here. Um, and with that one, it just it didn't need to be. It could have just used the one title. Now, as far as the three um, the three bonus songs, they're all very mellow and acoustic based. I think that you know, there's nothing really rocking on them. They all have drums, so they're not just sort of drumless songs. Um, and the fact that they're not part, they're considered part of the album. I kind of like. Okay, well, I'm glad they threw those on there because. I'm glad they didn't make them part of the running order of the album because it would have really, really slowed things down. But for what they are, like taken sort of as a separate entity, um, I don't mind them. Sister Sleeping Soul is uh, the only co-write that Steve Howe has on here. He co-wrote it with um, John Davison. And, you know, it's okay. Um, not really. It's not as memorable. It's definitely not as memorable as, as uh, really any of the tracks on the main album, but not bad. It's definitely not one that's a waste of space. It's just an idea they had. They, they went through it, and well, that's kind of it. Although it's interesting to note that uh, Steve Howe plays a Portuguese 12-string guitar on this song. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, you wonder Very what a Portuguese 12-string cool. guitar sounds like? Listen to this song. Because it's the only guitar he has listed on here. Because sometimes it's mm -hmm. a combo. Yeah. Uh, next one's next one's fun. Um, it's called Mystery Tour, and you may ascertain from that title, it's a it's a Beatles tribute. You know, uh, John was a fighter, and Paul was a worker. You know, George played guitar like ringing a bell. Ringo held the beat till the axe fell, and and uh, yeah, there's there's all kinds of lyrical references. You know, and and uh, all the way back to the first Yes album, they covered the Beatles. They did uh, Every Little Thing, and of course. Um, 
what's oh it's gone the title's gone right into my head but um Oh, it's a uh, yours little no thing. They, yours is no disgrace. They uh, yeah. they throw in the give piece a chance. So yeah, there's never been any secret of them. They're they're Beatles fans. So it's a it's a fun song. Um, you know, the last line is kind of fun. You know, through the bathroom window without going out of your door. And then the last track, the last track, I actually think might be the best of the three, the strongest of the three. Um, it's a Steve Howe song called "Damaged World." Uh, it, you know, if they'd have made this a seven track album, I think this would have been fine as the last song on it. But um, so what are your thoughts in general on the three, the three bonus tracks? Well, like you, I'm glad they weren't part of the regular album because I think it would have distilled it down. I think it would have really taken away from uh, what I really liked about the first album. They would have been great B-sides if any of these had been singles back in the day. I could see these being B-sides. You know, I saw that title mystery tour and I'm like, OK, is this going to be a Beatles tribute? And then he starts in singing it. And I'm a big Beatles fan. And I just kind of like, OK, you're trying to throw in as many Beatles references as you can. Uh, you almost could, you know, count. All right. How many? You got Revolution. You've got, you know, like you said, through the bathroom window, all these different uh, you know, songs that they threw in and they talk about. Brian held everything together and Neil and Mal, which were, you know, the Beatles roadies. And I'm like, OK, well, it, it, <laughs> I, you know, I, as a Beatles fan, I just kind of rolled my eyes when I heard it because I've heard so many Beatles tribute songs and uh, I could have done without this one. It's OK. I mean, I get it. You guys are Beatles fans. That's very cool. It's just sort of like a very geeky fan written kind of a, a Beatles song, I guess. But it's fine. As long as it's not on the regular album, I'm glad I, I can appreciate these more because they're not on the regular album. I probably uh, wouldn't have cared, like you say, to have them on the, the regular album listing. But it's, as a as a bonus disc, I'm, I'm not going to complain. Like I, I, I agree with you. I think Damage World is probably the best of the three, but none of them am I going to pull this disc out probably and, and listen to these again I, I can't imagine wanting to i'm going to listen to the first the regular album proper I, it's okay if you're a huge huge yes fan and the more yes the better i suppose but um you know whatever they're just kind of bonus throwaways for me yeah and i and i said i don't know why i said six tracks there's eight tracks on the main album so there's actually 11 new songs yeah as an artistic statement it wouldn't have made any sense for them to throw because anybody could have written that, you know, any Beatles fan could have written that song. It's not particularly musically complex and lyrically, like you said, it's almost like a game of, you know, throwing those references in there. But man, um, you know, I'm happy to say that they did break that streak. I mean, seven years since the last album and they didn't break it for no reason. They, they, they came out, they, they had, they had strong new songs and uh, they, they put it out and you know i'm i'm, I'm happy to uh, be you know to have at least one yes album come out new as a fan to to hear for the first time and you know not be listening to something that's 40 years old or 50 years old so I, i'm quite happy with it uh, you know i i at, at this point it is fairly new i'd give it a solid eight out of ten it's it's uh you know it's not uh you know it's never gonna topple the you know close to the edge and fragile and they're not even like 90125. Like, I mean, those are just enshrined, right? They've, they've been around for so long. They're such classics, but a decent enough album. And if you kind of gave up on yes, after heaven and earth, I would definitely, this is not that. Uh, I really like fly from here. To me, this sounds like it could have come after fly from here, even though it's, it's John Davis on vocals. So um, that's our two cents on the yes album, the quest on Inside Out Music, uh, which I believe it's distributed by Sony. So that makes it the first quasi major label Yes studio album, probably since Talk, uh, to be quite honest, if we go back, because they've kind of floated around these mid, you know, these these quasi independent labels for, for many, many years. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad they put this out. I'm, I'm glad they, they, they did this. So, um, Jeff, what have you got coming up on Jeff, what's your final destination? Any, uh, any? You've always got a million episodes coming up. What if, what have you got anything particular planned? 
Well, the big thing now is that Get Back movie, the documentary from Peter Jackson, has been coming out over the past three days. Of course, it came out on the 25th, which is the American Thanksgiving, and then they've released one episode per day the last three days. It's actually close to eight hours long. And so I've been doing reviews as I've watched each uh, subsequent episode. I've, I've been doing reviews on that. Just recently, I got done reviewing the box set, the super deluxe box set, both the CD and the vinyl. So I'm all Beatles all the time right now. I'm in front of the TV, catching each episode, watching all three hours at a clip. So definitely, as a Beatles fan, a very exciting time for me to, to be getting into that. Um, also looking forward to The Doors. They're, they just remastered and re-released the L.A. Woman album as the 50th anniversary of course, that album came out in 1971, so I'm hoping to get my copy at the end of uh, this coming week, be able to do a review about that. Um, and, you know, Record Store Day yesterday uh, was, was interesting. Not a whole lot of great titles. I don't know if you got out for Record Store Day uh, no. yesterday, but yeah, there wasn't a whole lot. I picked up a Jimi Hendrix album and there was a Dire Straits EP that I got. But other than that, I didn't really see a whole lot that kind of you know, blew my mind. Although I did see they did a re-release on that Mr. Big. Um, yeah, that's that's one of the ones I would have liked to have gotten. But the problem is with those RSD releases, if you don't get it that first day, people buy them up and then they sell them at ridiculous copies. So it would almost be cheaper to go and find like a, a 1991 pressing from the UK or Korea or somewhere and get it cheaper than what you'd be paying for the new one if you didn't get it when it first came out. But yeah, that would have been one that I would have been looking for. And it was also a Poison Flesh and Blood, uh, which I don't have on vinyl. They came up with a, a green vinyl version of that. Um, that would have been cool. But um, yeah, most of the time it's, you know, the, the pressures, you know, the, there's too much pressure, you know, and you never know what the stores are going to get in. So, no, I, uh, Matt, who we've both had on our shows as, uh, you know, ventured out and uh, he did get that Aerosmith, uh, the road, the road soap. What's it? Not the road so far, but that that early uh, 1971 or 1972, he got that, which is pretty cool. I would have liked to have gotten that one, too. So, yeah, Jack, that thank was, you for us. Go ahead. I was just going to say that was gone by the time I got there. I waited yeah. and then froze out in the cold and went there and it had already been sold out. But, yeah, that's that's a great one to get if, you know, you're a big Aerosmith fan, especially their early period. But, you know, yeah. So, Jeff, thanks for uh, sitting in with me on this one. And uh, I think we were pretty much of one mind when it comes to, uh, yes, his new album, The Quest. Uh, it's not going to blow you over, but it was not, it's also not going to bore you. And it's a worthwhile purchase. So yep. thank you very much for, uh, for sitting in. And uh, we'll be doing more episodes together, I'm sure, in the new year. And thanks, everyone, for watching Tim's Vinyl Confessions. Yep, thanks.